If you're anything like me, you wonder, can I get my car wired for cheap? Or if you are me, you wonder, well, there's no wiring harness that is possible for what I have. Can I just make it myself? And you can also be like me and start with something that was absolutely horrifying and make it a little less horrifying. I want to take you guys on a little journey of wiring. Now, this is supposed to be a boring subject, but I am going to condense several hours, and by several, I probably mean 100 hours, of thought, process, experience, and all that into a very short video, relatively speaking. If you want way more content on that, actually, I would recommend HP Academy. Those guys have a wonderful program. It's expensive, but it is worth it for building harnesses at this level. What we are doing right now is building something I have never built before. And let me show you what I would say is the three major levels to wiring harnesses and what gets involved at each of those levels. This right now will be the top level. But let me show you a little bit of my history first. The very bottom level of wiring, I think, is modifying an existing car's wiring. And that is behind this right here. So as you see on the rotary Corvette, there are a lot of the existing old wires used to kind of fake the, the car running fine. That's level one. You splice into it, use duct tape, you crimp them together, maybe even some solder. That uh, works, <laughs> to be honest, it actually does work. But then level two is right here you start getting excited that you could possibly make your own harness and you do some cool things. You make a lot of mistakes, but they work fairly well. That is what this car has been for the longest time. This harness right here is that level two. It was all made by me, custom, as you can tell. I'm not trying to impress you with the harness, but I do want to point out that this car made 950 horsepower with this piece of crap right here. So don't let the looks fool you. The problem with this harness was that I didn't shield it. I didn't protect it inside of heat shrink. That's the only thing that was really wrong with it. And of course I used wires basically from Lowe's, O'Reilly's, AutoZone, and there is duct tape and weird stuff and some soldering all mixed in there. And including things like this, crimps that just don't do much. So that's like the bottom of the barrel level two. The top of the barrel at level two is what's in this car right now. I built a harness for the fuel tech. And I did, in fact, use a lot of basically 3M heat shrink to protect things that you just wouldn't otherwise notice as needing to be protected. Something where I messed up is like right there. I forgot to put something on that little crotch and you can see that the wires are exposed. Honestly, at the end of the day, having heat shrink on this harness is a fake job. I will tell you that as in, it doesn't change the performance of the harness. So your harness could, in theory, look like this underneath. It won't, but it could, and yet still make tons of power and be reliable. Fact of the matter is when you're doing harnesses for cars like this or cars like this, especially rotaries, you have oils, you have fuels, you have coolant all leaking on there. And your goal is to protect the wires from that. On top of that, Another thing that you're trying to protect the wires from is pulling. They call it strain in the industry, but pulling on the wires straight forward is one of the worst things that you can have happen. Right here, this is a ground. If I was to pull on this really hard, at what point does it break? And that's something that you take into account when making a level two harness. A level three harness, well, that's what we're about to go on a journey for right now. Level three, in my opinion, these aren't official levels, by the way. The highest level is very expensive. It is what you would see in an Indy car, a professional racing car where there are multiple people working on it. They need to trust the harness. It's not just you, it's a whole team and they need connections in and out that are easily replaced. So that type of harness requires even better protection. This stuff right here is kind of an industry standard now, I would say. It is still heat shrink, but it's meant more for harness making. It's much thicker and it's called DR25. That's the number and letter right there, DR25. DR25 is basic heat shrink. I still use on all the other things that are much cheaper, 3M. It looks like the type of level of protection that you're gonna get but that's not where you get the benefit of your heat shrink. The benefit of your heat shrink actually comes at the connections where you use adhesives and things like that to actually waterproof or oilproof the harness. Of course, it's gonna be all along this way, nice and safe, but then what happens when these wires meet other wires? This is not sponsored by race spec. I paid full price and it allows me to speak freely about this. This stuff is almost the same as the other type of heat shrink, except for one very, very, very important detail. It's sticky and it has an adhesive that melts and sticks the things together. Now you don't want this sticking to your wires. You want it actually sticking the pieces of heat shrink to each other. So you create this kind of chain of a sheath, almost like a snake skin, all the way around all of your wires. What about the wires themselves? 
This is where the expense really, really gets crazy. This is special wiring. And it's mostly because of the coating on the outside. If you guys didn't remember like DuPont and nylon, <laughs> anything like that, Teflon, this is gonna be in that realm because it is called Tefzol. It is a special type of coating that goes on the outside of the wire. At the end of the day, the wire itself is still basic. It's still just copper or aluminum or aluminum coated with copper. It all is just wire. So that was really deceiving to me as well is that I was expecting these wires to be or special and, and sometimes they are. In this case, the number of strands matters because electricity travels on the outside of wire. Less strands means less efficient, but this wire is more so important because of the coating. And with that coating, you actually get a much smaller wire. So look at right here. This wire looks very small and you'd think it is, but that wire right there because of the coating is mostly made of the wire itself. And the equivalent size of that, if you were to go to like a hardware store, Lowe's or even AutoZone, it might be even thicker. That is the same wire right here. Same 16 gauge thickness. Side by side, look at how much of the sheath is reduced. This Tefsel, the red one on the right, is more efficient, capable of handling higher heats, capable of handling ethanol, alcohols much stronger. This is what I've been using for quite a while because it's relatively inexpensive. This, you have to really know what you're doing when you go to use it. You have to have everything planned out. And so that's really one of the big key differences to making a really crazy harness like this. If you see this big harness right here, this is something called like a flying lead. This one came from Haltech. And as you know, I've been using Adaptronic, which Haltech bought out and made amazing amounts of horsepower and just done amazing things on that car there. And then of course, to be a good tuner, going and using fuel tech on the three rotor and having amazing success with that as well. I think both companies are wonderful, but they both offer this type of flying lead harness and it would basically be like a level 2.5. It's meant to be something that you do yourself. It's actually pretty quality wire here, but it is not Tefsel wiring to identify that when you go to Tefsel wiring, I mean, you're like measuring the thickness of the wires and making calculations with that on this harness. It's a lot more enjoyable to make, to be honest. This is a wonderful place to start. And I would recommend if you're ever going to build something as in insane as a four rotor or even just honestly not just but an indie car harness start making a couple of these flying lead harnesses first because you'll learn so much and each step you just kind of add tricks to your toolbox basically that make you just that much better at doing it on the fuel tech harness that we're about to make we have the connectors we have the pins for that it's the core of the harness we are going to make i'm sure some of you are looking at this beautiful face and wondering rob if you already have a three rotor running and a three rotor harness running why are you making another one well let me show you why specifically this is actually a very important detail and it's something i don't want to patch in later especially with that car being potentially dangerous as it could be i unboxed the drive by wire pedal as well as the drive by wire throttle of course the throttle kind of makes sense that is directly connected to the wiring harness i don't want to have another baby wiring harness also running in there i don't want to have to get confused if there's issues and i'm like okay is it this harness or that harness it's a powered piece to the car it's not a sensor it's not an injector which i'm sure injectors are roughly around the same amperage uses I don't want that to have really small wires i just want to do it right from the beginning all of that needs to work properly 100 percent of the time or i'm just adding tons of random crap to the car and gaining no real benefit from it. I feel like it's time for me to improve my skills because the skills that I learned doing that for the first time on this car transfer to the big boy in the back. So very important that I do it once before I do it for four rotor and learn the things that even I'm gonna learn going to this phase. That's something that is gonna make this harness slightly larger, but because of how small these wires actually are when you use them, this harness is probably gonna look much smaller than the previous one. What's the first step you take when going to make a harness like this? Well, it's a lot of writing. If you're unfamiliar with your fuel tech or how tech or any other ECU that you're working on, the first thing you do is actually go to their websites. They have phenomenal manuals and documents on what's kind of a generic way of wiring their ECU. So in the case of the fuel tech though, I actually kind of have that at the top of mind awareness from my previous one, just mark down what I wanted. This would look like kind of my end result of where I'm going with this. We'll start here and then work a little bit backwards. This is the lengths of the sections I want to run and kind of how they branch out inside of the engine bay. So the ECU's in the dash, we got a little bit of a run behind the center console and then it goes off to other things, whether it's going to be sensors for like the clutch pedal or whatnot. And then this section goes through the firewall and then into the engine bay right at the back of the motor right here. And then it separates off into very important sections. And all of that, I just simply took a wire and ran them from the back of the motor to the coolant temp sensor. Well, that's X number of inches. Let me give another 10%, 20%. And that's 
how I went and measured all of these. You can see I certainly want to replace some of the crap that I've moved out of the general place over to here. Here is the FT550, for example, and even that I want to improve even more. It runs about a foot here, splits off into here to other harnesses, and then runs you know, about 20 inches or so to the back of the motor. All these things are there. Why do I even need them? And that's backing up the step here. <laughs> you realize, oh, I have to figure out what I want on my car to begin with. And these are all the things that I wanted. And I kind of organized them in, in a very particular way. And this, I think it's more of an industry standard. These are all sensors and they're all like acronyms for sensors. So you're reading things from the engine. You're trying to read in this case where the engine is in its rotation, temperatures, pressures, temperatures, pressures, to, you start seeing a, a theme here, the turbo speed, speeds, and then we start getting into more advanced things down here. But really it's a lot of core parts are just the temperature and pressure, coolant, oil, fuel, and so on. On this side, these are things that you actually are going to be telling what to do on the car. Ignition, injectors, igniters, wastegates, drive-by-wire, your pedals. You all have control over these things on this side. And the reason you separate it that way is these are very sensitive. They're sensors and they're very low, low, low voltage. These are things that are driven. Sometimes they'll call them actuators. And those require voltage, require amperage, and as a result can actually cause interference with these. So these are really soft and gentle ones. These are the ones that can be more harsh and you want to keep them separate as much as possible, at least mentally. That's what I want to do. I personally feel that an engine that you have tons of sensors on that are useful can tell you very critical data and prevent damage. All of these things are maxing out the FuelTech 600 with every single sensor it has. They have an expansion spot. I think the Haltech has way more sensors, but trade-offs, and we're not comparing these two apples to apples because they aren't even the same type of product. This one is actually a dash built in. And this thing's got what's called a PDM built into it, power distribution module or masterpiece. <laughs> they both have other additional things that do not make them actually very comparable products. They serve slightly different uses. For example, this pedal right here has a sensor and a backup sensor in this. When you push it in, zero to 100%, whereas the throttle itself has two motors, you know, forward and backwards. And then it also has sensors to make sure it's in the correct spot. Those motors are the part that are driven. That requires power, significant power comparatively to open and close that throttle. Once you've determined all the things that you need, then you start trying to organize them. This is all trick and scratch. There's tons of different ways to do this. And I, of course, am also gonna suggest that you have thicker wires for the power, thinner wires for the sensors. And that helps you figure out the organization of this. And here comes down to, I want all of my injectors to go off together. And then that way you can grab that main stock and say, okay, all six injectors for this car, grab that main thing and then plug all six in. So it helps you make sure that you have everything plugged in as well. This is more of a personal preference again. I'm going to actually show you what it is to make this main section of the harness and I'll explain the reason why you do it the way you do it. Almost every single harness starts this way. The absolute core of an engine harness starts with the most important question in the entire engine bay as far as I'm concerned. Where is the engine at? And I don't mean the block like I did with where's the four rotor. Where's it at in terms of its rotation? We don't know when to fire the injectors. We don't know when to fire the ignition. We don't know what our sensors are telling us if we don't know where the engine's at rotation wise. These are all the E shafts for the four rotors. The one thing that plugs directly onto the center of the motor is something like this. This is called a trigger wheel. This has these little chunks of metal on the outer edges. And what those chunks do is when they pass by a magnetic sensor, they just get in the way. Basically cause this magnet to stick. So see that, like that? They don't physically stick, but the, the idea is that when it passes by, you sense it. You can sense that there is a chunk of metal, no chunk of metal, a chunk of metal, no chunk of metal. What that sensor is capable of doing, especially with this right here, it knows there's the blank space. Let me say, okay, there were five pulses. Boop, 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 boop. I know that I'm this far rotated in the process of spinning the engine. It's that simple. Oh, hey, there's metal. Oh, there's not. Oh, hey, there's metal. There's not. Oh, hey, there's an extra space. So that must be the beginning or, you know, the reset more or less. And it just goes like that in circles indefinitely. As long as your motor can turn over, this is the center of that. The most important part of your wiring harness is the sensor itself. There are a couple different styles, but this one right here, that is magnetic. And you'll find that all different cars have different types of gears like this. I just wanna point out that that data is very sensitive. What if it uh, just simply was a little bit closer? Well, what about all this metal inside the rest of the ring? Is it reading all that? It's, it's just simply reading that little baby chunk of metal. The information is very sensitive to the rest of the car doing obnoxious things. The very center of your harness is also the very center of your engine. And that is something that needs to be protected the most. So on this Haltech flying lead harness here, it actually has this thing, and this thing is meant to protect the data inside of this wire. It's called a shielded wire, 
and there's actually literally a shield made out of metal that is meant to protect the wires inside of here. Why do they need to be protected? Well, there's a thing called EMF, electromagnetic interference or magnetic frequency. And simply put, if you have this sensor connected to the end of this wire here, and in a perfect world, you wouldn't even need the shield. But if you took a magnet on the outside of this, you can actually change the data that the ECU sees from this. Those pulses, those little, hey, tooth, 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 don't become so obvious anymore, especially if you were to go back and forth in a similar timing. And the reason why that matters so much is because everything else is actually firing off at these same frequencies that this is reading. You're just gonna have a lot of things going on all at the same time, and you'll start getting interference. Interference on this wire right here is the death of the motor. You will blow your motor if this signal is interfered with by anything going on outside. What's most likely to interfere is actually just straightforward. It's your ignition coils, your spark plugs. Those create very high voltage, like little static sparks. And that static spark requires a lot of energy to create. And if that energy is anywhere near this wire, more importantly, the wires inside of it, that could really interfere with your data. Companies like this will produce something that is a wire or two built inside of a shielded wire, which is also then built inside of a really nice protective Casing. That shield means nothing unless it is actually grounded. What's important is that you're planning to put this in the very center of your harness, but you have to make sure that you plan to do stuff with it. We've established that you need this, but why does it matter to the harness? Well, generally speaking, at least in the things I've learned and seen, this is the center of your harness. It is a very thick, very difficult to flex piece of wire. So if it was on the outside of your harness and you went to bend your big harness out here like this, you would kink this or break it. It's just not worth putting on the outer edge. But if it's in the center of your harness and you bend it, well, that means that the whole harness can bend up to this tight without even thinking about it. And of course the harness would be whatever, an inch thick. This no longer becomes a problem in terms of how much it can bend. You're also protecting it deep inside of there, which is good, I think, because I would rather have my oil temperature sensor get weird if it was to be interfered with than this. So that it's kind of being protected a little bit by the other wires, but really it's actually just creating space between this and anything that intends to hurt it. That's the center of your harness done right there. You want to make it from A to Z. You want this shield to protect it as far as possible. The next concept, this is something that I learned amazingly from HPA, is the idea of concentric twisting. Concentric twisting just means really fancy braiding for adults <laughs> instead of all the Barbies I had as a kid. But what you're basically doing is just wrapping these wires around concentrically, so around a circle, around a center and this ends up being the center. So it also is really nice to have this beefier piece in the center and all the other wires spiral around it. You do enough wires in a spiral to make one layer and then you spiral the next layer, which is now even bigger, the other way around that and boom, that's all there is. Hey, you guys are done. That's how you build a wiring harness. If you don't do that, that ends up with something like this. What you'll see here, this wire right here used to be the sensor for the three rotor. And then right next to it is this huge red, which is you know, generally 12 volts, right next to it giving off heavy duty voltage to supply all the coils with power. So that's exactly what you're trying to avoid. If you needed them in the same harness, at least you'd purposely plan to wrap them in ways that keep them away from each other. Twisting is not necessary, but it is very helpful. It helps organize it, makes it look pretty. It helps you keep mentally focused on what is going where. I think one of the most important things about wiring is being able to look at something and go, oh crap, there's something wrong with it, like visual inspection. We're gonna make sure the next level that goes on top of this is the next thickest wires if possible. What you're actually doing with the next row of wires that go around this, those are all powers and grounds, not insane ones. I, I actually don't have the ignition system go through this harness. I actually split that off. That's something I've seen a lot of other people do and it's worked very well for me. It's gonna be one central power line for all the sensors. Sensors don't take much, if at any, voltage. So that little line isn't really gonna create interference on here, as well as the grounds for the ECU. Another major topic I wanna to talk about very quickly is grounding. For something as crappy as all of my random harnesses to run and work the first time and never be the problem that's causing problems with the car, I use very basic, simple, and clean methodology. If you're like, oh man, I wanna run a ground to here and then one to the body here and then one to here, no, 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 no. Have all of your grounds that matter to you, your the emotions, have them all go to one central point that's called a star pattern. It all comes from the center of a star burst. That point, for me, generally speaking, is on the back of the engine, on the very top back of the engine. My battery ground goes there, my ECU ground goes there. Every ground that I can think of goes there. 
because I won't have weird issues, I won't have talk back, I won't have ground loops, I'll just have one center point where I know everything is good and solid coming from there. And it's clean, it's clean energy. <laughs> it's almost like wind power, no. It's very clean energy all at one center point. In that case, the computer that's at the dash of my car is not grounded to the chassis near that. It's actually got a ground wire that's gonna be in this harness that is also going to the back of the engine block. I said, I'm gonna speed through the next step because obviously it's gonna be just a bunch of colored wires going through and being twisted around this. It's really pretty. Maybe we'll make it a little montage, but that's really all I'm doing is taking certain wires that I've planned and twisting them around this. And it has been a minute since I have used a GoPro chest mount, but let's get right to it. This will be an ultimate time-lapse part, but I wanna show you a couple of things I'll be using a lot of. One is these short little zip ties by a thousand of them. This is a hundred by a thousand. You're gonna go through them or you're gonna wanna go through them because they can just hold things in place. And as a result, you want things that are just dedicated to cutting things really easily. These type of style right here, perfect for clipping these without you know cutting your wire. Those are kind of like forming the core of your harness quickly. And if you make a mistake or try something else, you can just simply cut and put a new one on. So what I've done is I've cut this wire and I also have marked on the table, you know, what four or five feet, the table 60 inches wide. And I also put six inches and <laughs> that's for me. No, that's uh, just so if I need half of a foot of something. And I try and keep my harnesses simple in terms of lengths that are simple to just make so I don't mess them up. But this piece right here needs to be 72 inches. So that's 60 plus another foot. I added another six or eight inches on the end of it just because it's such the core of the thing. I wanna have access in case my, the way I split it off from there gets weird. So I wanna have extra on the ends, partially to hold it in a vise. And that's kind of one of the coolest things you wanna do at this point is you'll hold this wire tight and you'll wrap all the other wires around it. And while you're doing that, of course, you don't wanna then try and reuse the crushed ends right here. Expect another inch or so on the very end of the core of this uh, just to be trashed. We're then gonna take a certain length of all of the next row of wires. And of course, like you see, I've got wire strippers. We're not really gonna need wire strippers, but I am using them for the cutter part. Um, we will be using what's called Kapton tape. It's like Captain <laughs> Kapton, used in a lot of aerospace stuff. It's like 500 degree tape. And that's actually the reason why you're using it is that it will not you know, melt like uh, electrical tape. If any of you have ever made the mistake of using electrical tape in a harness, about two months later, you realize why you don't use it. This stuff's really good, it's very thin, but it's also it's not um, like electrical tape where it bends really easily, so you have to think about how you use this. It's very popular in harness building. It's very common to use 16 and then 22. What we're going to do is make a variety of these wires a certain length, cut them because I need multiples. I'll show you a quick way of wrapping them around there. But I right now know this core part, right about here, all these wires are gonna get split. If it's a ground wire, it actually ends up getting split to tons of places. And if it's a power wire, it does the same. So I'm expecting these wires only have to go from this section to this section here. Don't let that fool you. This thing has to make it all the way across. On my level two, I'm gonna have a 12 volt in, sensor ground, EC ground, spare ECU ground, red, black, black, red. So I need two reds and a black. All of those, they all end up right here. Uh, my ECU ground is an extra 12 inches from here. So 12 plus 20 is 32. And then it would technically stop right here because they all split. I'm actually gonna make them the full length and then cut them there. That's 32, 44 plus eight, 52. So I'll make all the wires that go from here to here 52 inches. Okay, we'll just make them 60 so I don't have to think about this. Okay. When you have these rolls up where I normally have them, you can then just take one and go, okay, that's the same length. I'll make the second the same length. There's two reds. Let them go there. The black, 12 volts in, 5 volts in. Black, black, black. So we'll do the same thing. Wires now. It is kind of nice to bend them backwards a little bit so that we get more nice straighter things at least don't just keep kinking up like this because like it's really annoying we'll end up having all of these something like this as the next step implies all you're doing is just simply wrapping these around and that's why i like having these untangled a little bit more because you're wrapping these around like this over and over now what you're going to notice is that the wires are actually going to leave this gap where you'll still see the green thing you don't spin them like this if you spin them like this you'll run out of wire length really quick so you do it at kind of like this angle here and when you do that you'll still see the green area. On a professional harness, you actually fill that with dummy wires or spares. So what we're gonna do is utilize the fact that we need more of these just to have more power or safety inside of the harness. 
So I think I'm gonna do another two or three just in case. One of the cool parts about the way you build a professional harness is when it comes to colors, you actually don't try to worry about, hey, this one is my ECU ground, this one's this ground. You make them all roughly the same lengths and you plan ahead. And then you can just grab one red one, test each end and say, okay, now when I'm building the rest of the harness, that is my certain wire. Not work in all cases, but it certainly works in most. Like you can say, hey, all my sensor wires are white ones. So you just run 20 white wires to the whole harness. And then at the end of the harness, you just go, okay, which one's the one I'm gonna make into a certain sensor. These wires look like they're stiffer because there's a lot more metal inside of there than this coating implies. And I think I'm gonna do two more reds. There's math and all that to these, but this should be way closer to making a full circle. You can see right there, I need to add probably three more wires. I can actually just do 20. I'm gonna just do the 20, mil 20 inch part. This part actually sucks because you don't want to use really good wire as a filler. I'm sure there's maybe somebody that makes filler wire. You're literally just using these wires to throw them away. That part hurts, but it also makes the harness way better. So I guess it doesn't hurt 100%. These are quite literally just space holders for the center section of the harness that goes from you know the inside to the outside of the cars. I want this row to be just smooth. It really looks bad when you don't add these wires and you put heat shrink on top of it. It just has this weird ass spiral, obviously possibly a place where you can have things hook up and hurt the harness. I don't even wanna take a chance with that on this one. And of course I'm on video, so I have to do it perfect, right? I'm gonna straighten all these wires out a little bit more just so they don't do this, especially as you're working down the harness. This becomes a source of frustration. When I'm normally pulling them off the rows up there, I'm actually kind of bending them backwards as they're coming off the roll. So that way it creates a little bit better straightness in the harness. So the way I'm doing it now is creating a little bit of lumpiness. So now that I have those all straightened out a little bit better, hopefully it'll give you a better idea of what it looks like and they're not so chaotic. It feels chaotic, no lie. And you could just kind of have to trust your process and not be interrupted at all. That's why I'm doing this at whatever two in the morning right now, because it just is a bad idea to be interrupted in the middle of a wiring harness. No matter how much you write it down, interruptions suck. I'm just gonna show you for the sake of illustration, not how I'm actually gonna do it. I don't want a GoPro on my chest when I'm doing it. I'm gonna show you how it kind of looks to do the first part of this harness and probably set it up to automatically do it from there. You're essentially taking all of these wires, kind of like that, and then we are going to do this, and here's where the zip ties come in. And this is also where it's nice to have excess of everything. Zip ties, wire, and I'm just gonna put this around here. And then we'll just put on that slight angle, and we should see this more or less try to wrap smoothly all the way around here. This is simply for illustration. This is where you'd want it on the vise. But I just wanted to show you that they ultimately end up wrapping all the way around here and the beginning of a beautiful layer of a harness is done. I'm gonna go ahead and set this up on the vise and get this section actually made ready. You see that even doing that as an example already made it just feel that much cleaner. At least it looks way less chaotic. You can use a crazy vise like this, expect the wires to be just trash. So I'm purposely doing that. So the center wire is all set up right there. And then we could much easier wrap these around. And you can see why I wanted to fix the tangle because it's a lot easier to do this part when this isn't tangling because you're gonna get these all spinning around each other. So you want them loose. We're gonna need a lot more zip ties for this step. I had to make sure that as soon as we get to the 20 inch mark right here, that certain wires are preparing to leave. It's not that they end there, it's just that they have that connection out there and that will be spliced to the part that then goes to the rest of the harness. These are ones that don't stop there. So you can see how this becomes very quickly a labor of love, especially if you're doing one that you've never touched before. Okay, so I'm organizing them, attempting to in a way that makes sense to me. Coats don't stick to the under layer, which is wonderful, but that also poses a problem right now as I'm trying to get them to stick. <laughs> it might actually make more sense to use the tape at this moment, just because the little area right underneath that part right there, that causes a lot of problems because a wire will just plop into there. So that's being a real pain in the ass right at this moment. I'm actually using the short ones and long ones. Almost there. Not like done, but almost there where it's actually starting to behave. This is gonna take a little bit of work. They're still bundling up right there. I hope it's close. I can always go back and fix that area. 
There we go. It's starting to play nice. I can feel the, the wires all starting to want to twist instead of fall on top of each other. And that's what, that's where I'm trying to get. I could have probably used one more to fill this in, but I think once I get the twist going, this will clean up even nicer. There's that mark that I set for 20 inches. This is basically the run, just to the dash. This is all the other connectors come off of here, go out about a foot, and then this is allowing us to kind of run from there to the ECU. This is extra just for wiring. This is extra just for actually pinning the wire. And then this is the running section of the harness. We'll stop at this mark here. And that's where a lot of these wires will actually exit or at least get crimped and then run along with this spot again. That's the majority of what it takes to make a harness like this, to manipulate the generic wires. So if you're gonna make a harness, I wouldn't even waste my time doing these, especially since it's not for you know, such extreme applications. I would stick with doing this sort of process, but with you know, cheaper and uh, easier to manipulate wire. But there you go, and, and that twist, if you're wondering what the twist is for, so that way when you bend the, the wire, you're actually not kinking the wire that's on the inside and stretching this one out here. Every single wire bends and doesn't get kinked. So it's absolutely wonderful for harnesses like this that snake through a car. I'm going to continue backwards, fix the areas as it goes back up to here, and then just basically rinse and repeat. I'll probably finish this level and I'll bring you guys back in and show you how you go and do the next layer of the harness. The harness section that is really interesting is actually this part here because this is going to be the part that goes out to the engine block. The engine block sitting kind of right here on, on out. This two foot section is what goes through the car and that's the part that you want to focus on first because if you start finishing this section, it could get too thick and that section definitely get too thick for you to slide your sheath for this section on so you really have to think ahead for that much we'll get to here kind of build the harness from here and then you can go out that way and out that way We are going to stop at this point right here, only because I'm not crimping these wires ahead of time. That's the right way to do it. I didn't, but it gives me a little bit of room to work with. There's my mark. Let's actually hit that almost perfectly. The one thing that you have to learn over time, you can try to remember this ahead of time, but it just does not work, is just because your mark is right there. So for example, that is where I want the wires to split. They will not split there. They're actually going to be sheathed and then they'll split off here. So you always have to make your mark about an inch before you plan on splitting off, or you have to make sure that you split off an inch before the mark. Regardless, that means that this mark right here, that is actually not where I'm gonna split off. I'm actually gonna try making all the crimps and stuff back here, so that way they all meet up and then start splitting off at that point. That's just one of those things because of the way the heat shrink on the outside work. There is the beginning of the core of the harness. These wires are gonna run all the way. And these are all filler wires. These medium length ones are gonna be split into 10 to 12 splices. They go to all the different things at the end of the harness. This part's actually really fun. I'm gonna show you guys through a time lapse what this is like, but I've got eight of these. I just made the red color mean 12 volts. And then I've got 11 of these really fine looking ones. These are all sensor grounds. And so I've simply crimped them all into place right there and then heat shrunk it so with a single wire kind of makes sense to fit with the fatter bulk. How do I get to this point? Well, it's obvious. I gotta enjoy showing you guys this too though because sometimes you skip steps and it's therapeutic to see. I've made this color plan to be my five volts so I can quickly see that this is not 12 volts and I'm simply making it three feet long. I've got enough wire for this. I'm gonna need seven of these. So I'm just sticking it up here. And then I've got one, so I'm simply measuring them all the exact same length and then cutting. Small step you can kind of assume, but it is nice to see sometimes on camera. These are all 22 gauge wires that I kind of mentioned earlier in the video. I was always worried that this isn't enough power, or at least that it would get too hot, problems or resistance, and all those sort of things that happen when you have too thin a wire. But this may be my first time running it this thin. Normally I'm overcompensating. I think we'll be pretty safe. The idea of the Tefsil jacket on these is actually meant to retain more heat or prevent more heat or however you want to look at it. And so they're actually rated for higher temperatures, which is kind of a, I would say an asterisk next to that because it doesn't mean that they don't get as hot. This is five, seven. Grab all of these up all to the same starting point. And I'm actually gonna zip tie them all together so that way we don't have moments like this. We're gonna pull the wire sheath off a little bit on each of them, get them ready to be bundled and then crimp 
all together, so I don't want to be too close. Now, when it came time for the sensor ground, I had to make sure it wasn't any of these other grounds, and I had to make sure it wasn't any other possible wire. There are two wires that do run along this cord. These two are my ECU ground, so it's purposely two wires crimped at both ends. Those I did not want to confuse with my sensor grounds. Those are totally different purposes. One of these is my 5 volts, one of these is my 12 volts. They both split to here, and they both go to here, so it really doesn't matter until I start putting the colored wires on there. Okay, now that one officially is 5 volts or 12 volts. Up until this moment, it doesn't really matter. And this is kind of a cool way to do it because we'll work that way and all of that based on the color is exactly what to do. So then we'll, we'll have to make sure though, I brought my meter over here and test the end of one of these and then here and there to make sure they're all the five volt lines. Now there are a lot of like tools meant specifically for Hefzel wiring. On the other hand, one of the things you want to do is only use tools specifically for it and not use them for any other job. If you're only doing one wiring harness or your own harness, it's kind of hard to follow that, but it's a good goal very very hot here it's 103 degrees outside so my hands are slipping a little bit and i'm actually wiping down the harness from all the oils on my hands just to prevent that from causing problems especially as we go to put the heat shrink on now when you have moments like that you have to make sure that you're not cutting the wire we'll inspect them all at once so all of these are actually going to fit inside of one of these crimps kind of like this i'll clean up the lengths a little bit but they'll all fit straight through there and then crimp through to the exposed wire of this and then i'll heat shrink it with that type of heat shrink it's actually a sticky heat shrink my goal is to actually seal these off so that way if say moisture or whatever got into the harness and it got through to this section and this section that it didn't cause a harness to short out inside of it highly unlikely but why take the chance at all this little brass thing i actually clean off the edges right there those can cut through the heat shrink pretty easily there are multiple ways to do these major crimps this is actually a pretty reasonably priced one tool's expensive it's basically just a standard type of crimping tool but with extra leverage right there it's ready to go it doesn't matter until we make it matter so i'm gonna cut this wire i cut it kind of back so they're not all in line i kind of want to stagger them like i did it back here because look you can't even notice that they're all staggered i'll start this one here no it doesn't really really matter because all of a sudden you now have this bundle of wires past it you know it's consistency there so i'm gonna put this little guy on this nub and then we're going to there we go that's looking really good use another zip tie now we're ready to crimp and i don't want to miss one so there we go this will all fit inside of this quite nicely so what I'm gonna do now is just check each of these wires and make sure none of them just pull out. Go ahead and tighten this a little bit more. I'm not actually going harder, I'm just making sure the ends of that brass piece don't stick up. And then we're gonna heat shrink this piece onto right here. Partially to uh, cap those ends a little bit, partially so that way it builds the thickness of this wire up. So when I put the other side on, it'll seal to both of those. It is 102 degrees, and I'm wearing a GoPro chest mount, so I'm even hotter, and I have a battery pack in my pocket that's heating up. It is not cold. <laughs> that looks good that as this twists around, it does not stay in line with the sensor ground, so this will stay pretty close to where I was aiming. I'm actually using the sticky version mostly for protecting this, like I said earlier, with the oils and whatnot, but partially so that way when you pull on one of these, it's not forced to just be on the crimp itself. So it's got a little bit of what they call strain relief. We now have this whole pundle, which is capable of going to almost exact end. The only one that goes this far is actually this green and black one. That's for the crank angle sensor. Everything else kind of takes an exit before that. This is the last one, and that is my 12 volts. And you guys get the idea. Same concept with this one right here. I wanted to show you guys a not so GoPro view of the wiring harness so far. So on this end is where the ECU is. And then I've got four spare black wires that you'll see somewhere in here. Stop and then start back up right there. Ignore those, those are just filler wires. We have a couple of crimps that gives us a ground, the three that are down there, a sensor ground, five volts and 12 volts. And then the rest of the core of this harness continues on till it starts to crimp right here. And that's where you see the dotted reds, those are five volts, the solid reds, those are 12 volts, and then the blacks, those are all sensor grounds. The two thicker ones right there, those are engine ground. And then these two longer ones there are actually drive by wire. I just wanted to make sure I had thicker wire for that because I wanna make sure it's as responsive as possible. Right here is of course gonna be the back of the motor. I'm also going to trim these back right before the crimps. So that way it makes an even tighter, smaller spot here. I'm gonna start adding the next layer, which is actually the reason that I have the kept on tape. This tape right here is ultimately gonna be like a Teflon holding this layer together and allowing the layer on top of it to slide back and forth as the harness gets bent. Once I get to this point right here, 
I'm gonna go backwards and do all the heat shrink on this part. So that's all done. And then we've got this wild cat of nine tails, if you're into kinky shit, <laughs> going to the end of the engine. Then we can take our time getting each of those doled out. But I wanna make sure that I don't go too far without making this center section heat shrinked. Cause my God, once you fill in this side with the ECU and fill in that side with the sensors, you can't get back to the middle. There are a lot of really cool ways of calculating how wide and diameter of the next layer of this harness or you can be lazy and kind of a visual learner like me and just simply cut up, that's about 27 of them, and spin them all the way around. And that's kind of the idea of what the next layer is going to look like. Thankfully, it helped me determine that I'm going to have to pull one of these out of there. <laughs> There's, like I said, there's tons of math. You take the diameter of this stock and then you figure out the diameter of these. And it's tons of circles around a circle, around a circle, and away you go. Or I'll spend about $4 in wire and figure it out. The step that I cut out from here to there is pretty obvious. I took, whatever that is, 25 wires of various colors for the different sensors and whatnot. And I simply cut them all to the same length, 72 inches long. And then it took a little bit of work to get them to all spin around that part right there. You can see I'm spinning them the opposite way of the inner layer. That makes it even easier for them not to get stuck on the inner layer. And of course, I have all of the little bits of tape that will also help it slide. I am going to cut every single one of those zip ties off. That's going to be a pain in the ass, especially while trying to do YouTube. But I'm going to just simply be braiding all the way down. These wires, for those of you wondering, are all wires meant to go to the engine, not ones that go inside of the car right here. Clutch switch or transmission or anything like that. Those all will be on another outer layer. We'll talk about that in a second. The very first thing I'm gonna do is actually get wild and cut this zip tie right here. Use these nice little tiny ones so that way I don't cut anything else. This is simply a step of Barbies where I'm gonna basically braid these all, bring them all in like this nice swoop of hair, I guess. Oh, I forgot to clear this off, but we're simply gonna take this whole thing, watch it whip, and then probably nae, -nae over to the other side. No longer necessary. We'll get all these wires out of the way so they don't confuse. So we're simply going to massage these into place. I did some calculations to get the exact number right on this part. I'm going to be spending a lot of time kind of combing down the rest of that because that's obviously a complete clusterfuck. I'm actually going to twist it just that little bit more and it, it does also help tighten them up. This is where it starts to look really pretty. And of course, there's a certain angle of twisting that you want. It's generally right around there. And that angle is meant so that way when you bend the whole thing, it can not kink unless that is your kink. But we're just going to start it right there. See how it starts to twist on themselves. This excess wire is going to be quite a bit of a challenge. Could fit one more in there if we really wanted to. You can see that little bit of gap. I added another green one because I was thinking about making that optional and I added it down here and it just slid in perfectly. There's a little bit of space maybe for another one but I am going to leave it as is because it gives that nice little bit of flex. And the rest of this is really just popping all these off and it's going down the chain. Purpose to put tape before, during, and after the splices. You'll notice that here and here. And then I put some in the middle along the runner. We'll see how well that works. I'm actually just doing this just to get them out of the way. Not even anything more. It's more to kind of ready to be in their spot and so it doesn't kink like this. this first intersection here and this is where we want to make sure that they go around these three without really interfering none of these break off at the same spot so that they're just kind of passing through so these will just kind of poke through at different spots I think it's working but just barely Take a look at this. There's a little bit of a cluster right there. Made that pretty solid without any major problems. Sending these would definitely be a better strategy next time. That was rather 
painful. I seriously have one just stuck up there. This one needs to come off because it's actually incorrectly set up for those beam layers around. I mean, when you lay the groundwork for this step, this is very gratifying just combing this down like this. Okay, we'll stop it there because I have another one of these. Appreciate how it's coming together. This is so nice. And we're finally to the main point where we're going to stop twirling all these because they no longer twirl, they split out into all different things. where it stops. There we go. There is every single wire all the way to where they start to split off and the adventure gets crazy back there. But those are all the wires. So we'll end up taking like one of these, one of these, one of these. And that'll be for a lot of the temp and pressure sensors. And then of course, injectors and wastegate and whatnot all there. Very first thing I want you to notice is how much smaller this harness is. That's insane. That's the whole harness as far as the engine's concerned. I just want to admire this real quick before we wrap it all up, but there is 20.5 inches of the core harness between where the things split off and get ugly. That section is 0.46 inches wide, which sucks because 0.5 plus we could use a little bit thicker of this right here. There's the DR25 UK, just means that it's got the white instead of the United States yellow. What you do that's actually kind of complicated, but you get used to it over time, is see how this is three quarter inch? Well, it'll shrink down to three eighths inch. So three quarter is 0.75, so it'll be half of that. The problem is if you did one inch, it shrinks down to half an inch. So it's a two to one shrink ratio. That means that this 0.44 inch thick set of wire would just be banging around inside that one inch tube. We don't want that. We have to use something slightly more snug. So I'm gonna cut off 20.5 inches of that, go back to the GoPro and show you how this section is finished up. Put it a little bit longer. While this stuff's already thicker than the 3M stuff that I use, I can feel it. That's already a, a positive sign. It feels more like garden hose than the actual heat shrink. It's probably why it's so much more expensive. It's gonna go almost directly to the end of that. We don't want the heat shrink sticking over that, so we are gonna cut it down just a little bit. Okay, it's a little bit better. So this is going to get interesting. I'm going to try a little trick cutting the ends of these off so we don't have to mess with any of this. It's actually the first time we're taking this off of here for a second. So far everything's playing nice. We're going to have to get creative in a second. So the first issue is that these are not going to pop out in time for that end. So we're just going to slide this all the way past here, and then we'll just pull these back through here. We're going to go ahead and crush this tip <laughs> back in here. And then we get to see this slide back into its correct position. Okay, this is much beefier than I was expecting, so I don't feel so bad using the slightly thinner stuff. But we're going to go ahead and start shrinking that up. We're going to end up splitting all these up. There's going to be heat shrink coming all the way to here, then we'll tape the center area, and then put sticky tape between the two of those to hold the sections together, and then we'll put some, basically epoxy into here, so that way that's all heat shrinked and, and waterproof. Kind of same concept right here. There'll be an extra row of wires going outside of this, going on to these there. Nothing else goes from there to there. This is my very first Raychem piece. I hope I don't screw it up. I'm going to start from one end because it kind of shrinks as it goes, so I'll start from the end. I really want to make sure it stays at. Pretty good so far. Again, much beefier. This does not have adhesive in it, so the wires can move freely inside of this. That is rather impressive looking. It hasn't shrunk all the way as I was intending. We need some more heat, look at that. That's what we don't want. The good news is this stuff is really resilient to heat. It certainly is showing by the way that this process is going, which makes me feel good about how to handle this generic heat in the engine bay. That's impressive. I was thinking that that wouldn't be the right choice. That's by far the right choice. Okay, that takes a lot more to get it 
formed. But my God, is that amazing. Oh, that is so flexible too. It shrunk on both sides, at least an eighth of an inch. That's also good to know. I didn't see that going on as it was happening, but it's still on the tape, so that's good too. Well, there you have the core, core, core of the harness. Just a quick preview. That's the center of my harness for this car. Oh, that is beautiful. All these wires inside of this need to stay safe, obviously, but imagine they need to stay oil safe. Well, now that we've made this piece, we have to make this thing basically oil proof from end to end. And so we're gonna make sure that when we put a piece of heat shrink through this whole section, the glued heat shrink will basically waterproof these together. Same thing on this end, all the other heat shrinks go into the engine, will get then glued together. We could cut all the wires outside of this thing, cap all the ends over here off, fill it with water from that end, and you would have a vessel. You'd have a thing that could hold water or airtight and <laughs> definitely temperature resistant as well. So we caught a little bit of a lucky break right here. My fear was that this section would be difficult to get to from that side. Well, that would be absolutely the case. And then my other fear was once we start filling in this side of the harness, it would be difficult to get to the center again. Why do we need to get to right here? Well, we have to make a section that goes between this and all of the pieces here. It's gonna be all sticky. It's gonna go like that. This area here though, is where we get kind of a lucky break. I've already cut most of the wires needed for that area, but it will end up needing a whole separate layer, but it's not much thicker. This piece right here, based on measurements, this section will finally be big enough. It's over 0.625, which is 5 eighths of an inch. I know that from all the doweling. And so this is an inch and a quarter, and I know that that means that that'll shrink onto that impressively enough. So with this shrinking onto that, and it of course will be even crazier over here, this will absolutely fit over whatever we have to throw in the way right there. We're basically good to just continue on. So I've pre-cut all of these. What are these? Well, six of them are the ignition signals. So these are just data lines. They go to the coils, the smart coils. So there's six of those there. Three of these are sensors, and that includes the clutch pedal and some other things inside of the car. And then these are all data lines to relays. So for example, turn on the fuel system, turn on the fans, turn on the water pump and a spare. So those are all of our lines that we absolutely need. They're hypercritical to this. Well, we know that we want them to go off with this bundle particularly. Technically these six don't need to, they can go off on their own, but that means that we're gonna have to tape that area and get this layer on top of it. So we're gonna set these back down a little bit of tape real quick on the other side of this. I think I want to make it as close here as possible. So we do want these to come down. This does move just a little bit because there's no adhesive on it. We'll pull that back just a little bit. We're going to go back to our zip ties and we're going to actually go the opposite way of the previous layer. We know that we want them to end up roughly there. Nice spot. This time I'm working kind of backwards and they're much shorter so this is a lot easier to do. But these don't need to be this long so I'm kind of working off of what this side ends up being. So the only downside to the concentric twisting is that it shortens the wires and you can actually probably figure it out. I'm just going to use the advantage that these are short and see where they end up and then kind of pull them the other way. What you're noticing is that I'm not finishing this layer. I am actually going to cut a bunch of, sadly, a bunch of wasted wire and fit them in on this as well. I'm kind of wondering if I want to make them like ground so the harness is naturally grounded. I want to like use the dead wire for something useful, but it's already looking really cool. Something I've noticed is that DR25, so the heat shrink, is much thicker, and as a result, you could probably hide or get away with a layer of this. Not that if you were a professional you'd want to do that, but you could probably get away with it and it wouldn't look like my other harnesses where it looks like a boner in sweatpants and you could just tell that there's a layer missing shit. I'm just going to set this here before we put any tape down and just kind of figuring things out. This is the first time I've gone on any of my harnesses I've gone this many layers. Sadly, we're just going to fill all of this extra space in with what looks like a waste of wires. I'm actually kind of making some official steps here. So is this where I want to put this? Because then all of these wires going to the connections, I'm going to back up a step. Okay, so what I'm worried about is when I go to put the pins on everything here, I don't have enough wire to work with. And that was my reason for making this section so long, was I'd have plenty to work with. There's no reason for this extra length, to be honest. I put the tape kind of back an inch, it's not much. I think the layer underneath it's a little bit further up, but 
skin, not too worried. I'm gonna go ahead and cut more of the wires and then fill this line in, but this is really how it just goes, rinse and repeat. I now have the spares all set up, and it made me wonder off camera, the reason I hate this concept is because of the cost. What is the cost? How much does it cost to make, this is now 13 wires, and they're all approximately two feet long. Well, it's, it ends up being about 26 cents for at least the average guy like me, like in terms of buying it online. It's 26 cents a foot. Long story short, it comes out to about $14. So this is $14 of wire just gone. For the sake of, I guess, looks and functionality and not snagging the harness on anything, it's worth it, but it's still $14. Just to put it into perspective, the kit for this DR25 was $600, $550. The kit for the sticky type that's here is like 60 bucks. Each of these wires, you know, you're talking about a $1,000 harness, I think, almost in materials, of course, spares and shit like that, but $14 means nothing in the grand scheme of things. That, mindset I don't like. It looks like, sadly, I'm going to need to spend more money on these spares because that's not going to be enough. Another $4 down the drain. I made a minor mistake of making them the same color right next to the color that I was going to use. I'm going to mix that up a little bit, move them over here because that's just asking for confusion. I think using red and white was kind of a bad idea too because that's really confusing to look at. But there's a center chunk right here that has basically all of them good to go. Kind of work backwards. Do this one again. So my goal is to have them all kind of lay down right here. Just get them all to the same spot. Don't even need to cut them to do this right. Perfect. We should have one, two, three. Right to the edge there. So this is something I'm still working on is exactly how to do these parts, but I certainly believe it will go something like this, basically taping all of these down. This is that area where the sticky tape is going to potentially stick to the actual wires. One of the reasons you're using this tape is so that way the outer layer of goo, whether it's epoxy or tape or whatever, doesn't stick to the wires underneath. That's pretty snug. Let me kind of rework the rest of this to fit that. Okay, so those are all the good ones. So I'm gonna cut all these just to really reduce confusion. We really only want them going to the tape right here. That's, that's their only job, is to kind of protect the harness up to this point. So I'm purposely twisting this outer layer a little bit more, as far as it lets me anyway. That way it, it can bend as much as possible too. I'll do the most stressful thing I think I've done so far. So I'm going to end up taping right to there. Safely in there. And I'll sit down this side too. I feel a little bit of wiggle room in there, so might as well let it do what it wants to do. This is major progress because that's the core of the harness on this side. So before we go to wrap that up, we should have six ignition coils, three, six, three inputs, four outputs, sensor ground. 12 volts in, 5 volts out. He's moved a little bit, I don't like that part. But at least the yellows are on the outside, so those will go into one harness and this will go into another. Okay, so now let's hope this section, okay, we're slightly over 0.5, which means we can use the one inch stuff from as close as possible here, all the way to halfway here. That gives us enough room to kind of pin and move these around and splice and do all that. So we need to measure that distance. Well, these are the $500 or $600 set of DR25, quite the investment, but it's honestly worth it. And there's the $60 sticky box. So those two work together. You get 15 feet of the one inch. See how this will treat us? That's crazy that that's actually going to fit in there. And then we're right to there. And I'm actually going to cut it a little long because now we know that it wants to shrink. And fortunately, this stuff isn't sticky, so we can also move it. So when you're building a normal harness, adding all these extra wires would have made it impossible at this point to get anything to the center part. So that's why I did the center part first, just for clarification. So I'm gonna go to there, I'm gonna go to here, get rid of that 
And this little guy will get under there. We don't want that. This one, we just shrink like that. It's starting to feel like a real harness. And that's why I've moved this all the way back here. I need a lot of room to manipulate and do all these crazy things with all these. I'm gonna put these almost nose to nose and we should see it shrink up and come back on that side. Super curious to see how this one inch section works. This is gonna take a little bit more work, but it's certainly, geez, it's hot. It's the right size, but oh my God, is it just, just barely. <laughs> certainly going to prevent any sort of damage to the wiring harness inside of there. But you can see it's a little loose in certain spots. And especially I noticed where the name's printed. I'm gonna double check after the fact, of course. 5.4, yeah, so it's certainly the right thickness. But I mean, we're trying to shrink it all the way to its maximum shrink. So it's gonna fight me a little bit along the way. I purposely squeezed it back a little bit this way so it's still back on the tape. That leaves this little bit exposed. But again, remember if I was to put epoxy or anything in there, that tape is protecting the wires from it. But we're getting close. I have simply braided this one. It's all six wires. It's gonna have a plug that comes out at this end. And then this one I also braided, but I added four extra wires into there. So that way it is nice and smooth on this side as well. So I've measured this one and the best is going to be this 3 8 because it's like 3 16 somewhere in there. Actually, let me make sure. It's slightly smaller than a quarter inch, so I can't use half inch. We're gonna use 3 8 Try to shove it all the way into that crotch right there. And then I'm actually gonna cut right past that to somewhere in here. And I might actually wrap this one a little bit more with the tape all the way up to here. The reason being is that the, the bottom area is actually just to hold the tips of these in. We'll just let the DR25 figure out where that is. These wires are now going to behave as much as possible. We're going to take our chunk of 3 8 This will be our first experiment with how this is on this side. Once we get to that side, we want to really understand what we're doing. We don't want any guesswork. So that goes all the way down there. A little bit longer than I was expecting. It'll shrink a little bit. Let's find out. And this stuff is just resilient. Oh, look that's poking through on this end. I cut it this way. Man, that just looks so, so professional. Because again, all of those extra wires do make that look nice and clean, super flexible. This little guy is actually going to be my quarter inch. And I'll be careful with this because I don't have much. 25 feet will go very quickly on this end. Quarter inch, and then actually, this one's my 3 16 I'll use a lot of 316s. Well, I might not. I might go to all the quarter inch because uh, this stuff's thinner. But normally I'm doing a lot of 316s on like the normal harnesses. This one really does not have to be this long. I'm probably gonna have to order more. So let's see how much this one shrinks. This one's gonna go right to, I don't already shrunk. I cut it a little short. So in preparation for that not being a catastrophe, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it even further down here, just in case. Because again, I do not need these this long. This is just the wire happened to be this length. These are just passing data. There we go. Also extremely flexible. So now we're left with this area right here. And this is gonna be our very first test of how much I can make sure this works. <laughs> so I'm assuming, let's see, this is going to be 0.71. I could use one inch, the one inch sticky. This is inch and a quarter and it'll certainly work. This is inch exactly, and it will definitely work. And so I think I wanna use the inch partially because it's cheaper, partially because this isn't the same type of situation where you need to make the biggest one that can work in here. This has got adhesive. I want it to clamp down and I want it to hold. So I'm going to tape within there just one more round inside of there and then get all the grease off of this part. This one's on the inside of the car, not that critical. Who knows, I'm gonna purposely try to do this one as properly as possible to learn what I can do for the outer ones, all of this shit. This one's gonna be the most critical one right here because it's gonna go to like seven major stocks and a couple other things. So this is kind of a good test for that. When you look at the Horsepower Academy, they actually suggest taking like sandpaper. So I think you'll see me do that. That is not my original thought. So I already did the other ones on the inside. I'm not too worried about this. I just wanted to make sure it's all held together. Okay, so I'm gonna get some 
rough sandpaper. That wasn't great. That seems <laughs> reasonable enough. What you're doing is creating a lot of surface area. The whole reason for this. So we now know exactly how long this has to be, and we are going to use the one inch one. And we're going to make it this slightly larger than the area I've scuffed. So this side doesn't need as much, so I'm going to favor the side where these need to be held in at. So I'm going to kind of do something like maybe that. What's somebody going to do? They're going to rip and pull at these. The more glue that's on that side, the better. So I've done this before, but not with any of the professional proper tools. Right there. One of the things you'll see a lot in the Horsepower Academy is strain relief, and that is something that they taught me beautifully. I'm going to put this here, so that way it holds those there. Wish me luck. I don't like how short that got, to be honest. I messed up there. But the glue is sticking, and it is almost completely covered, except for the areas inside the center between these three. That is like a crotch of an area where there is actually air and whatnot else able to get in there. That is certainly holding everything right there. Not my finest work, but it's also my first. What we're gonna do is we're gonna learn how to pot. <laughs> we're gonna learn how to put potting compound, basically epoxy, inside of this triangle shape area to continue this glue all the way into the center there so we fully seal the air from outside of here to inside of there. Okay, this turned out better than I was expecting. I'm very, very pleased with it. The GoPro can't do it justice. But what I'm about to do on this side of it is actually use a, a cheat, more or less, to get the rest of it done. This is the hardest part, I would think, at least to make it look simple, because that's the core of the harness. But back there, I can actually use just about any rotary engine. This is a two rotor, but that knot that you saw where all the wires come out goes to right here on the very back of the engine. And so whether it's a two rotor, three rotor, four rotor, they all have the same path to their oil sensors, oil temps, all these down here, generally speaking. They all have the same rear rotor, second rotor. So you can use this and then use your imagination from there. Of course, the one thing that is different is that the crank angle sensor is longer on a three or a four rotor, but intake manifold, all those are roughly in the same spot and we'll use those to make this harness. I do want to take a real quick close up of this. I reworked it because I went too hot on the glue and I didn't scratch it enough with thicker sandpaper. It looks a lot better this time and then we'll work on porting that. But I just want to show a real up close shot of all this. All those wires are hidden inside of here and it's just super happy with how this turned out could certainly use a little bit more heat. Almost looks simple and that's the goal when you do something like this. So here's where all this planning comes into play big time. Right now we could make every single one of these wires go to every single thing that it needs to and we would waste a lot of really expensive heat shielding. What we need to do is try and make little stalks or trunks that go from this center area in the back of the motor and then have like a major pathway to here major pathway to here and so on. Keep in mind, the center of the harness no longer matters. It is the center as it goes across the motor, but it is no longer the center of the harness. It can just basically just poof, goes into the ways that you planned. So what I'm gonna do from back here is have the grounds, which I ground everything to right here. That's where the center of the whole car is grounded right to the back of the rear iron. So I'll have the grounds come out for sure by themselves. It's simple by itself. Then we'll also have about a 10 inch section. Basically, I'll just measure from here to the center of this iron. And that will be the stalk where I will put all six injectors. Each injector requires a 12 volts and the ECU signal. So that'll be what, six injectors, 12 lines, and then branch out as efficiently as possible. Over here, I'll have a, a stalk that goes to oil pressure and oil temperature. Somewhere in the middle here, I'll have another stalk that goes to the throttle, which is gonna be up here, this area as well as intake air temperature. I'm gonna have some extra bonus things going all the way down to the end, so I don't know, maybe I'll bundle those all in the core and they'll get to about here and then start splitting off. What you guys are about to watch is probably worth playing some smooth jazz too, so Joel, when you see this, it's probably a smooth jazz moment. <laughs> but what I'm gonna do is basically organize all of these wires into sections. It's tedious, but it's actually one of the easier projects once you've got this all planned out. If you've got this far with a wiring harness, this is actually probably one of the easier steps. So you can see all the injectors are all going to the same spot. Oil, oil, fuel pressure, flex fuel if I want that. That goes to another one. Drive-by wire and air temperature. Crank angle sensor has the coolant temp sensor and spare communications. And then a whole stock for the exhaust pressure, turbo speed, 
and electronic wastegate, and then there's the ECU grown there. I am going to start separating it into these. Now the first one on this is my injectors, undo the hair, get it all back to about right there. We don't have to follow the set of the harness, that's just holding it up right now. Undo all of these, there's the ECU ground, and these two are the right by wire throttle, so those come off there too. I want this to have full flexibility. As we're looking at this, these should end up kind of crossing over or sticking under and then going to somewhere over there. So we'll set those down like that. We do know that all of the solid reds, which are 12 volts, they're all stuck together anyway. Should be six of these. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh yeah, there's eight. Two more for spare things. So we'll try and make this as pretty as possible. We'll take ones that want to be close to each other. They're all crimped together, but I just want to make sure that these all come out like this. These two will go to other things. And then I will have these injectors, which should be these, these six of these right here. I'm trying to make sure that all of these wires can go back as far into the guts of this thing. So that way we don't have a long ass knot in here that these are all going to right there. So I feel pretty good about this one. Six and six. It could change some just zip tying them together. So then I wanted to have these two go to their own thing. It's a little wasteful, but I love the flexibility of moving them around around. Injectors are always the easiest one. Oil, oil, fuel, fuel. So some of this I'm just kind of doing from memory. Some of this I'm not. We know that every sensor needs a sensor ground. So the sensor ground is in the center of the harness for that reason. Easy to get to. All the black lines and then all the red lines are for pressure sensors. So it's kind of like a grab bag. Ground, ground. Flex fuel, fuel pressure. That's four grounds, four sensor lines, and then two pressure lines means two five volt lines. A nice way of designing a harness this way is that all the pre-wired flying leads, you're like, okay, this wire has to be this one. Right now I'm just picking physically which wires work best close to each other, and I'm working around that, and that is actually very, very nice. Of course I'm following color trends, but that's it. Okay, four sensors, four grounds, drive by wire, Airflow, air temp. Air temp is thankfully one of these. So drive by wire is two wires. Air temp is one wire. Definitely need a five volts for that whole drive by wire setup. This is where I'll end up cleaning this up a little bit. And most importantly, drive by wire gets its control lines, which are all the way down here. Two drive by wire control lines. Drive by wire sensor ground, air temp sensor, air temp sensor ground, five volts. Then whittles away very quickly. Let's focus on EMAP. So EMAP is easy because that's pressure sensors get five volts. Okay, there's a pressure sensor. EMAP. Turbo is another five volt. That part works out well. And as well, one of these, one of these. And then E gate is two of these yellows which are kind of inconveniently on the other side. I do not recall if the E-gate takes more. Yeah, the E-gate does take 5-volt E-map, 5-volt turbo, another 5-volt for the E-gate, two E-gate lines, temp and position, E-gate control, power. So we are currently left with these wires. One of them is supposed to be the transmission speed. That one goes that way. Do not mess this part up. Take this one. This one will go to this bundle. I will take with this one out of this bundle. This one goes into this bundle. And these two are now transmission speed sensor. So that leaves us with a lot less. A lot of these are going to be spares. We got easy ground. We got all of those done. Engine coolant temp. So we're guaranteed a set of these goes down this is engine coolant so it's guaranteed to go down here that one we make as long as possible and this we have essentially a spare 12 a spare 5 volts a spare sensor ground two spare sensors and then three spare controls this actually worked out better than i was expecting that work better or worse that seems kind of worse if they do go around this I don't think it's enough though. So everything is accounted for and it's pretty tight, better than I was expecting. Not perfect, but not bad. This is where I want to make stalks. I'm not exactly seeing easier ways to do some of this. This just is. It's actually going to kind of fan out a little bit instead of be circular. There we go. 
Okay, I like this. I like this a lot. So my biggest concern is this one right here. I want them to be all together until they're not. And then the downside is, how many wires is it going to take to cover this properly? I want to make sure that I add a couple in there. And that's how you That's how you do it. So I've made some very executive decisions on how this harness is going to play out. And I think that most of these are going to get a little 8-inch extension. It saves me from wiring all of those separately. Like this core part of the harness will actually get a 1-foot extension. So these wires aren't as beautiful or as perfect just because there's not a center per se. This this one will make it look good, but this little one right here, not so much. I'm making this a little bit tighter or at least more twisted so that way it fits the heat shrink even more. Because I'm going to try to use 3 8 That is the injectors right there. Best 1.7. That's 3 16 so this will have a little bit of wiggle room in it. Because then my next best guess is to go to a quarter inch, which I really want to avoid using. Would work though. Maybe I'll do the quarter inch bit. But I'm going to need a shit ton more of really small stuff. This one's the E-gate. So this one will go much further. And then these last handful of wires. And one pair for the engine coolant temp sensor. This is something I wanted to do on the last harness. Let's actually finish this. It basically gives us the core of the harness. Nice and clean right there. Just focus on just this part. It looks so much easier. Actually, looks like there's a lot less in the harness. Hi, baby kitty. I want to add a couple wires to this section. Now this should be perfect for the three eighths. That is the beginning of the next step of the harness. That one turned out really good. Okay, yeah, that didn't turn out as nice as I wanted it to. It still works. So I'm gonna do eight inch sections here. I had the choice between this and this, and I'm definitely gonna do this again. With this harness finally at this point, I'm gonna remember some things, of course, that would have been useful a couple minutes ago, and that is that I'm going to use another piece of non-sticky stuff just to cover that gap and then put sticky stuff over that. I remember that after the fact. Thankfully, this harness should let me maybe get past there. We'll find out. Don't think it'll slide on at all on this side, so let's hope this side's feeling generous. Good sign. Please go past this, and I don't think it's going to. This is a perfect example of why you do this at a time. That is sadly wasted, and that was three quarter inch. I can cheat and make the same thing out of, this is one inch. This is basically guaranteed to fit through here. Okay, please work, thank you. This should actually fit in here. I've covered all that with yellow tape. Definitely helps bridge the gap. This is one inch as well. I might actually be able to get away with exactly this piece. Do something like that. And we will thread this one on. That's exactly where I want that. I'm not going to go for full heat. And there we have the core of the harness done. I'm gonna finish the rest of this tomorrow. It was a whole day of work, honestly, getting to this point, even though I've done a couple harnesses. <sighs> so I went ahead and labeled all of these and learned a little bit of myself along the way, but 
I used a nice, a simple label printer, cheap one, whatever, 20, 30 bucks. Printed the label out, cut it out a little bit, and then wrapped it around there. But labels fall off. The adhesive is horrible for wiring. So I then bought clear heat shrink and put it over it. Now the problem is I made the heat shrink way too long and it actually makes the wire less bendable. I didn't realize that this clear heat shrink would be so uh, inflexible. So what I did as I was going through it, I started cutting it down to this size because your goal is actually to keep the name clean, not so much oil up from under it. The name is obviously the most important part. It'll, it'll be stuck there indefinitely. So I'll keep working on making that better. I have all these labeled. And how did I label them? Well, I went backwards and figured out exactly which stocks were what. Something as big as this one, crank angle sensor. So I just went through and traced those. That said, I now have to kind of take the next major step, which is the ECU side of this. On this side, we have four layers. I've spanned them out a little bit. We're gonna start from the very middle layer, and that is the other end of the crank angle sensor that's the very center of this. We are going to make sure that the shield that's inside of here is actually grounded to the engine chassis, not to sensor ground. And that'll prevent any weirdness of taking down the rest of the engine or the harness. What I'm going to do simple enough is actually take my multi-tool. This will be your big friend here. And I'll tell you what, you can actually buy all these weird ass ends on Amazon for a couple dollars and you have choices on which ones to use. For every one of the wires that are the same color as the other ones, you're just gonna strip back a little bit of the wire. So we strip this wire and then I'm going to attach it on like so and trace that wire down. Now that is a, I set the meter down to beep when I'm touching that. And on this end, one of two things, I already kinda know where those thicker red ones are, but say, so for example, we'll check this one and oddly enough, that first one happened to be the right one. One by one, you go through and you pick them and you, you do what you need to accordingly. The reason I'm doing that is these thicker black wires, some of them, I made a mistake and didn't cut them back like this because I didn't know exactly what I was gonna do on this end yet. And so some of these don't go to anything. What I wanna do is find which ones those are, cut them back so that way they're just not in the way. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue figuring out which wires aren't needed and we'll be right back. I've determined which ones are the spare wires in here. And we're just gonna trim it back even more just to get them out of the way of thinking. One of the major things that you have to do on the computer end of any harness is deal with your crank angle position. This one's kind of the only wire that has multiple wires in it and we actually have to bring it back to a point where we're gonna do some business with it. We'll just start here. We can always go back further. There's a whole wire nest inside of this thing. So you have to be very careful. I'll start from the tip. Just the tip. <laughs> just to show you, I'm kind of grabbing just the, the sheath. It's all metal inside. I don't want to cut any of this. You can see there's a braided wire and that's the shielding. We'll take that all the way back here. And the reason why is we want that shielding to ground out to the engine side of power. Hold that sheathing off of there. And something I saw, a real cool trick I saw on HP Academy is they unwrapped all of this back here and they basically snaked the wire out from the side here. Not an easy task to say the least. They always make these wires so thin, asking to be damaged. So we'll pull that out. That's one of the two wires, and then the other one shouldn't come out much easier, I hope. It's very hard to do while trying to hold the damn harness. There we are. So those are the two signal wires needed on the crank angle sensor. Different cars are different. A lot of cars, you actually would have one of these wires, the black one, go to sensor ground. But on this one, on the fuel tech, these two wires actually go specifically to two signals, they will stay separate. Kind of clean this up and we're gonna be crimping all this wire to these two. So that way that is now grounded. That's why I wanted it kind of further back. I might take it further back even, so that way we're not wasting a lot of this distance from here to here. Take it far back as I can safely and then everything else can just be pinned to the ECU. What I have done is I've made the shield into a little nub and then these two ground wires, same rough length, all right like that. I'm then going to take these two as well, this is very tedious work, and I've got some heavy duty, like double level crimpers. These are not cheap crimpers, and they allow you to multiply the force on this little brass piece here. And I'm going to put them all in there. There's like a whole science and math behind using the correct size one of these brass things to the amount of wire you have. In this case, I'm just doing going off of what I've experienced in the past that's worked. Feed these also back into it.
A, a proper wiring harness person, especially if you're watching, which I'm sure you've already thrown up by now, a proper wiring harness person would actually have done these crimps before making the harness, but I'm still not comfortable enough with the lengths of everything. This is how the little brass pieces come. They're really relatively inexpensive. The crimper itself is, is the most expensive part, but these things, small, medium, and large, basically. It's deceiving with this hefsel wire, this really nice wire, because they look like they should be a lot smaller, and they are not. What you see me doing is just kind of gently holding it. So far, so good. They make little arms and stuff to, to help hold all these wires. In my case, I'm trying to do it for the camera. Well, that is probably overfilled a little bit, but I am still okay with that. Make sure there's no wires in the whole crimper. Sometimes you'll get wires that'll go in here and then you'll crush those. You have to be careful with that too. That's lost a couple wires that way. Pull it back before going all the way. It actually makes a nice little clean setup like that. Making sure that all looks good. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just, just gently crimp it on the front side and the back side just to take these little edges off. Because those edges I think would cut through over time. They would cut like heat shrink or whatever the case. I'm just kind of more or less doing this just to round the corners. One last time in the middle. The brass forms around it so you get kind of an indented way. But there you go. That is a nice and clean way of having the grounds also provide the grounding for the crank angle sensor. So I'm now going to wrap this in heat shrink and then wrap the whole area in heat shrink so it kind of holds it all together. These wires are honestly the strongest wires in the whole harness, partially because they're you know the biggest wires, but they're also holding on to the center of the center of the harness and that's the strongest part of that too. These also are slightly shorter now than the rest of the wires and I kind of like that because if you were to pull on this harness and you didn't have heat shrink to adhesive, this is what will get pulled first and that's the strongest part of the harness. So I, I kind of appreciate that versus sensor wires getting pulled out and you blow your motor. FuelTech sold me the connectors for the FT600. They're Super Seal, Amp Super Seal connectors, pretty straightforward. They do open and close with this little connector right here. So when this is pushed down, it locks all the pins in place. And then to release the pins, push right here and open it back up. What we're going to do, like I said earlier, take the two battery grounds, the two ECU battery grounds. One goes in each of these connectors, so we are going to pin these and then have them hold each of the connectors just sitting right here so we can figure out where the rest will go. I am going to do something that I have seen before. This is again my first harness to try all this shit, but I'm gonna do that thing where I twist the wire, kind of a little corkscrew shape, like right here, like that. Not too tight, the reason why is so that way, if you were to pull on it, at least the wire has some give. There's a little bit of like last second give. We'll hide all of that, because yeah, they'll all be curly cued and it'll shorten the length a little bit, which is fine, this, this is exactly how much I wanted. There'll be two connectors, you know, side by side. The connector doesn't have something to hold on to. I might just take some of this stuff, which expands when you push on it. And since this is the ECU and it's this isn't a watertight connector to begin with, We'll just put this stuff inside here so it's just out of sight, out of mind. Nobody can really nick it on accident. I don't really have a good solution. A lot of those heavy duty wiring guys do. I do not. I'll start pinning these out. It's really, really straightforward. I haven't gotten to the ultra professional level yet, but these pins have two parts. The one part is for the wire, the next part is for the wiring jacket. These super steel ones have these two little, like, uh, I was gonna say anal beads. <laughs> There's two little anal beads on there. Those are different than like your typical ones for a DT Deutsch connector. Totally different. Looks similar, not the same. I have a different tool. This one you get for like 20 bucks on Amazon or whatever. Bends the two blades in like that. You kind of hold it in there, crimp it. So we'll do that actually with the very first wire. Crimp it like that. Crimp it with the even smaller one. And there you go. You have a real nice clean crimp there. It's holding onto the wires. And then I do love this style where you have these digging into the plastic outer. And that's the best part because Tefsil is even stronger. That is a beefy connection. And I'll review FuelTech's website. We found it on the website. We're simply gonna press this in. And because these are the 16 gauge wires, it's very easy to do. And it, it makes a nice little semi pop. If it doesn't go all the way in to where you can see it on the edge right there, probably have something wrong with the lock on there. Don't overforce it. The smaller wires, they'll kind of collapse if you push them too hard. So you have to be very careful with the really small ones. That's why I'm starting with these bigger ones. And now it's holding that connector in space. This is what I'm doing over and over again. It is nice when you have a flying lead harness where these are already done. But there's a benefit to this is that you can just kind of pick and choose. You can be a little bit more lazy on, hey, you know what, we'll uh, let these go in this order. What is nice is that this ECU, and most ECUs, you can just pick, 
hey, this sensor is sensor one, this sensor is sensor two, while we do have it where, hey, this one's already labeled as a flex fuel sensor, we will have to find it and then we can just put it in any sensor port we want. And really nice there. But these are just going crimping one after another, nice and straightforward, super predictable. Crimping the wires and then pushing the strain relief pieces and then just gently crimping those. I actually once in my past wiring days crimped the strain relief too hard and it actually cut the wire off the piece. So you don't want to crimp those too hard, but nice little check on each one of those. There we go. We'll do these last couple ones and I'll show you how to do the next step. One of the greatest things about building wiring harnesses is, is thinking ahead and that is probably the hardest thing to do and that's the greatest skill needed for this. But what we are going to do is take some of this remnant stuff that I have from a mid-level harness and put this over this area. Now this is actually kind of a good test because if this snags and catches on these things and pulls them out, well we know they were not terminated properly. But my goal is to end up having it kind of look like this, more or less, better than having the wires fully exposed. So we're gonna slide that all the way back there and then I have this piece, which I hope shrinks down way more than it looks to hold the end of this in the correct spot. We'll just kind of set that out of the way. We'll go back to terminating all of these. And all I'm doing is twisting them. It's gonna be a complete mess, but I'm just simply twisting each one and then putting it into the spot that I'm aiming for. Most of these, like all these white wires, not these two, these are the crank angle sensor, but all these other white wires, you can, even though there are specific wires in the harness, you can actually just say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The ones that you can't do that to are the green ones and the yellow ones. Those are all like, hey, this is ignition one, ignition two, injector one, injector two, and so on. So not all the colors can mix over, but the white ones actually, that's a nice little shortcut for saving us some time. But in a couple seconds, you're about to see a really bushy tail on the end of this harness. After all of that work, I put them all in there and found them in their correct locations. It's very hard to make something look that simple. And of course, there's extra ground I forgot about on there, but we're perfectly fine from a structural standpoint. These both plug into the back of the FuelTech 600, like that, and like that. And so I wanna make sure that the wires are all kind of rested in a spot that is best for that, which is gonna be something kind of in that area. And then I'm hoping, we'll see right here, this little thing might not work exactly as I wanted to, but I want it to just kind of cover the wires, especially if we ever need to modify anything. This is the sort of stuff, like I said, that it's all trial and error here. And I think it might play nice a little bit, but not as nice as I want. I was then going to use heat shrink and hold it in right here and have it cover the rest of these wires. I need to look at doing this better, and that's kind of half the fun of learning. Uh, you gotta squeeze it together to make it bigger, remember? What are we talking about, Joel? <laughs> <laughs> um, in this case, I think that's almost good enough. I'm gonna wrap it the end up in tape. I made this because my string gauge shifter, I wasn't forgotten about, but Fuel tech likes to have that kind of be on a separate little thing out of the rest of the harness, but I still wanted it to be on the harness. And then we'll just bring this up and over and then heat shrink that on. And at least it'll just kind of keep the wires a little bit more organized. Kind of hold both this and that in place. And I don't think this is the best solution at all. It certainly is still a solution and it cleans those up a little bit more. Kind of use this to hold the rest of them in place and then trim them from there. They make boots and stuff for this, but I, I just, I'm still learning. Okay, that is uh, atrocious at best. You might see the three rotor later and it'll have none of this. It's sticking to itself, but it's not sticking to that. That was a massive flop. So here's attempt number two. I've wrapped Kapton tape from here all the way down. We're gonna slide this from the back side. So we're gonna heat shrink this on and then kind of let it go until it stops somewhere probably right in there and we'll leave it at that. But don't do this until the harness is completely finished. I feel overly confident and I just kind of want to finish that corner. Again, this is kind of fun to test different methods for this. Unless it's something this massive, you are not going to get it back over this harness. So we lucked out that this random piece came with the uh, Haltech harness. It feels like it's not going to shrink. That's my favorite part about this. <laughs> so we want them to kind of stay like that. And then we'll just let this thing shrink. Okay, so don't put that much heat on there. That was kind of promising. I'll go ahead with lower heat. This is kind of where I was expecting it to end up. At the very least, my wires are still protected from all the gooey shit that's inside of this. And the whole area overall is still pretty protected. Not a sellable product, but it got closer where I was going with this. 
I need to learn more about those heat shrink boots that don't have stickiness in them, that just kind of like more or less are socks that stick over this. That looks way better than the other thing, but still not, not impressed. So you guys see exactly what I see. I just spent probably the last five hours doing what you saw over and over and over again, starting with the injectors, pinning those out, and then moving on to actually complex ones that really require the pins to be in certain spots, all the way down to things that are gonna connect everywhere else in the car, literally it's called in-car. This one is kind of arbitrary, I just remember which ones are which. This one is also same thing, spare. And I also doubled up on some of these because this massive size of heat shrink, even though it shrinks four times, it still is not gonna get from this big down to this big. So I have a piece that's gonna kind of be a buffer zone and go from there. That said, I am super excited because every single one of the connectors I have, I've modified to make them completely conceal the wires. So we are going to do something really crazy, and this, we will time lapse, I want you to watch it until the battery runs out. This is new to me, and I'm absolutely in love with this process. It makes the whole thing way more expensive, unnecessary. This is the epoxy gun. We're going to put the epoxy tip like that. This is gonna get messy, it's gonna get crazy. It's gonna be fun. I'm gonna go ahead and squeeze the epoxy. And you can see both halves coming through there and mixing back and forth until the result that comes out is actually a almost perfect mix. Okay, so what we're gonna do is start with the injectors. We'll look at our inspiration right there. I don't know how I'm gonna hold these down without burning myself each time, but we will try. But what I'm gonna simply do here is put Epoxy. Turn this down lower. It'll be useful to have an actual temperature gun at some point. This hooks in under there, so that's why this is so important. It flies around like that. I'd like you to shrink without moving so much. Keep it in place before it gets too small. Okay, there we go. Finally coming together. I know there's epoxy in there. I think we'll get this process good. It's actually unpredictable, but it's working kind of well. Wow, it's crazy it does it that way. This is a mess, but at least I didn't trash any of them completely. This one actually should be fun. It's got an existing boot. I've done these before, but I've not used this. This will be very interesting. This boot's already a tough one. It's all sealed. You can't see it sealed on this side. I'd like to. Now I'm ready for this style. It should have the smaller one. So I'm gonna add some glue to make sure this one seals to this one, and it'll add some thickness. So slip that over. And here comes the scary part. This is the drive by wire. Gotta get it gooped up. <laughs> I don't even know if this is the right thing to do. It sticks out a little bit more than I was thinking. It's definitely going to inward. Well, we get what we get now. It's doing what I was hoping. It's holding onto those corners there. It's completely sealed in there. It's held on this bottom here. It had some messy clusterfuck, but it's still better than nothing. That's certainly going to hold when you pull on it, and it's almost 100% sealed. I can't exactly tell what's going on in there. I am very happy with that. Sadly, that's gonna be one of the easiest ones to see in the engine bay. It'll be a testament to my learning. It's weird, but I'm happy with that. Now, you could actually do a proper boot, but learning. Same concept here, but this one's gonna be easier and, and more fun. This is what proper boots are made for, but it's still working. Doing this more for aesthetic reasons. So that's kind of hilarious, but 
nonetheless still sealed. I'm curious to see how this will dry. This one is the oh, same exact thing. Let's see if I can make this one any better. I think it's pretty safe to say the boots become worth it when you start getting to this level. That turned out way better this time. Got some more sensors. Actually, this one's going be really fun to do. Okay, I have a feeling that there's like an ink version of this that comes out on these plastic pieces. That's crazy. Some of these are hideous, but extremely functional. So now we're on to the biggest reason for all this. These are all the sensors that hide in the back corner. Oil pressure, fuel pressure, oil temperature, and so on. So these are the ones I really wanted to do all this for. Because that's where I've had the most corrosion. So these are going to be kind of janky. Well, I cut one for this and then used a different one. I don't think this sensor is going to fully seal. But I do think this sensor is going to be preventing itself from getting pulled too hard. That actually makes it easier to slide on that epoxy. It's like a slider. Not half bad. I'm very, very pleased with this one. I strip did not expect it to turn out even any bit good. That is not a connector meant for that. In the future, I could all sand these down a little bit. Majority of the harness is done. That is insane. That is a lot of work. And I created a lot of work for myself. I'm gonna take all of this, hang this side up. Let's take a look if they really made each other all messy. They did. My rear just once turned out the best. That part's really blowing my mind. And what I thought would be the simplest ones are the worst. Thankfully the injectors are good. Next time I'm just gonna do this side and let the normal adhesive get that side. Cause that's stuck to it. You guys made it to this far in the video and just like making these harnesses, it's just as grueling if not more. I wanna talk about the breakdown of the cost really quick. The fact is it costs more to make your own harness the first time. We added it up and just to buy the minimums of things needed to do this harness, you're talking about fifteen dollars to $1,800. Out of that, $500 was actually the kit for the DR25. You end up having plenty left. Probably make two harnesses with that. I'd say roughly 250 of that is enough for this. The Tefzel wiring was $300, and I do have probably half of that, maybe even more left. I could probably calculate that. You have to order 100-foot minimums, and you have to order you know, certain length minimums. And then I added it up, and all these connectors added up to a couple hundred bucks. And then the boots themselves, all these boots that you saw on the injectors, those are $7 a pop, plus the epoxy, the potting compound, plus these with boots, plus labels, if you get labels, I made them. But you can see there's a lot of hidden costs that add up really quick. While I wouldn't consider this a full-blown mil-spec harness, it is the core of one. It's Tefzel wiring, it's sealed end-to-end, -end, and it's got the concentric twisting, it's pretty nice. Just to give you a comparison, it's $300 just to look at the beginning of the four rotors injector harness alone. All together you end up spending basically $200 on just getting these connectors and all the pins and everything ready to make a wild harness, sub harness, not the whole harness. I can tell you right now, the next video is gonna be on the drive-by wire. We already tested that. I just want this video to focus on what it takes to make one of these harnesses, at least as a personal hobbyist. You're gonna require a lot of tools, so those, that cost is also not figured into the price of this harness. But at the end of the day, you can rip on your injectors and the harness isn't going to break. I'm very, 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 very happy with this. Really, if you compare the Raychem DR25 to the normal type of heat shrink, it's a, a world of difference, absolute world of difference. And so I was afraid of buying it because I was like, ah, it's gonna be the same shit. This stuff is amazing, very, very soft, and it keeps its elasticity for a long time. So those of you that are like me that want to compare this to say like a Rywire, which I know Rywire, I met him a couple times, nice guy and decent product. You're talking about $900 to $1,000. What does that get you? Well, he does use the same type of Tefzel wiring and he does use the DR25. So you actually get a, quite a nice harness for that and you don't have to do the labor. But where that starts to differ from this one, there's not a single boot 
on there. And those boots, we're talking $7 a piece, plus all of the epoxy, plus all of these connectors being boot-based connectors. This is actually where it adds up a lot. You're talking a couple hundred dollars in just that alone. On top of that, it's not a custom harness that he makes. He makes standard harnesses. And as soon as you go to a custom one, when I had him quote me for the four rotor, it was three to four grand without mil spec connectors. So basically almost this, not even again, not with the boots, but three to four grand. So you can see that labor of course is going to add up. What would you charge somebody else to make this? You, you saw how much time I spent. You'll never be able to charge a thousand dollars for this. So there are price ranges and I can tell you the differences between those and they certainly make sense. If you really want something to be sturdy and oil proof, this is the route to go. What's different about this harness compared to what is on the three rotor already? It's gonna kind of blow your mind. Again, I made this harness what I thought was the best of my ability and I still came up short. This harness has these pressure sensors and because I didn't have or understand what those connectors were, I crimped the ones in from my older cars that's all exposed, it's all crimped. It's nice, but it's all just sitting out like that. It's gross. Same thing with my oil pressure sensor. Look at that, you can see exposed jackets, and that's oil getting all in there. All of these are all using just 3M's type of heat shrink, and you can see it already is just getting rough. Yet again, exposed wire, oil's just getting into all of that. I'm pretty happy with a lot of this, but it just starts to fall apart. Here's my crank angle sensor. And I don't know how it's been running like this, but it's passing straight through both the coils and the spark plugs. That's why you want it shielded. I would never do this, so I don't know if it ended up like that. I tried doing jacketed things, did not work. My ejectors, this is what I hate. Watch this. I'm gonna go ahead and try and pull this. You can't easily, especially if it's under the there and you're turning the, the manifolds in the way, you have to sometimes pull on this to pull these off. And this is pretty standard, this is how it is. If you aren't grabbing onto here, you are literally grabbing onto the crimped wires to pull that back. That is my biggest pet peeve, and we have that no more. We really are just gonna clean up all these extra wires that are coming through here because we aren't sure exactly what this car needed. So this is actually gonna get much simpler and much smaller. We'll see a lot of this disappear. I hope this video kind of encourages you to do this. It saves you a lot of money on the back end. At least making a second harness, you're gonna do even better. This was one hell of a journey. Then our next video is gonna be all the drive-by wire that is already working inside of this and getting that damn three-rotor to pull a wheelie.